Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, February 6, 2019, Market Watchers Live show with your host, Tom Boley. Aaron Swenlin is out today, but should be back to join me tomorrow. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's going on. The market was down earlier, bounced back. Now it's uh, just down a little bit. The Dow Jones Industrial Average currently down 39 points. The S&P 500 down seven. The NASDAQ down 28 points. The Russell 2000 down a little bit more than two points. 10-year Treasury yield continues to dip, uh, not really bouncing much off that low. Down a little bit more than one basis point today, 2.69%. Volatility index continues to drop, even though the market is down today letting us know that fear is coming out of the market. That's not good news if you're on the bearish side. Uh, technology leading today, uh, having a pretty nice day, but communication services uh, to the downside, uh, you can see down more than 2%, mostly because of a few internet stocks we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, Skywork Solutions came out with their earnings, also a $2 billion repurchase agreement, uh, a repurchase plan. And uh, Skyworks doing pretty well, even though I believe they had lowered their guidance going forward. Still a nice rally on SWKS. Here are the three companies uh, really struggling today and taking down the internet group. Electronic Arts, you can see down $12 with earnings. Uh, Take Two, also getting hit pretty hard, down $12. And Activision, you can see down for a little bit more than four and a half dollars, almost 10% today. All three of these stocks though, breaking to recent lows. Not good action at all for the, the uh, internet space as a whole. Um, you know, I don't know. We got uh, still some issues to, to uh, work our way through. We've got the uh, ten-year Treasury yield, as I said, struggling. It's telling us money still looking for defensive areas of the market, not great. But then on the flip side, when you got volatility index continuing to drop day after day and the fear coming out of the market, it's one of the reasons why when we do see a little bit of selling, it doesn't seem to stick and the market comes back. So a lot to, lot to think about, a lot to deal with. Uh, I do have a special guest in today, Dan Russo. Uh, Dan, I know uh, last time you were in, well, last couple of times you've been in, we've had kind of crazy markets going back and forth. And now we got a, this, this uptrend that doesn't seem to want to end. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I think the last time I was here was kind of right at the, right at the start of the big drawdown. Yeah. And uh, I mean, what do you make of this? I mean, I know you've got your presentation. I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but if you've got, you know, if you take a look at the market and you see where we were five or six weeks ago and everybody talking bear market, and technically we did go down more than 20 percent, but I don't think too many people thought we were just going to come right back out of it in this V bottom. I mean, what do you make of it? No, I think you're right. Um, I think most people were looking for a retest. So market kind of did its job of embarrassing the greatest number of people at any given time by continuing to rip higher here. But I think you brought up a couple of good points in terms of the 10-year yield. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit in my presentation that you know, there are signs of you know risk-taking in the, in the market, especially with the VIX down back down around 15. But if you look at some of the leadership groups within the market, it's kind of sending a, a bit of a conflicting signal when I see you know, areas of the market like real estate and utilities outperforming along with software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a weird combination. I've seen a bunch of that, not quite sure what to make of it. And, you know, as far as the 10 year treasury yield goes and the, and the bond market, I always view the bond market as being the smarter of the two markets. Usually when there's a divergence between the, the bond market, and the stock market, I tend to agree more with the bond market, but we're seeing so many signs in the in the stock market that makes it appear the market doesn't want to go lower. I don't know. Uh, you ha you do have that. And I think you're, you're also seeing it too within, you are kind of seeing it within the credit markets. If you look at say high yield, mm -hmm. right? High yield kind of fell off, fell off a cliff going into December along with the equity market, but that's snapped back. Uh, that's snapped back as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Lots of good stuff. And again, I don't want to steal your thunder. I'm going to have you back here in about 15 minutes or so, if that's okay. Great. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'll let you uh, present to everyone. I know everybody gets uh, a lot out of presentations, so looking forward to that. All right, our upcoming schedule, as you see on your screen, uh, we have Roman Bogomazov uh, going to be joining us tomorrow. And then, of course, on Friday, Mary Ellen McGonigal will be back with What's Hot, What's Not. Probably a lot more What's Hot than What's Not at this point. Uh, next Tuesday, Aaron's Workshop. Not sure what she'll be doing, but I'm sure she will share that with you as we move forward. 
Uh, oh, and Rick Ben Senor coming on uh, next Wednesday. So a pretty good lineup, as you can see. Lots going on. Definitely stick around. Hang with us here on Market Watchers Live. Today, Dan Russo will be back here in about 15 minutes. Going to go over his take on the markets. Definitely stick around for that. 10 in 10, our first stock today will be Gap Inc. GPS. Take a look at the chart. See what you think. See if you agree with me. I'll go over it annotated along with nine others. Uh, just a little bit before one o'clock Eastern today. And then we're going to end it today with a new segment, Break It Down. I'm going to actually break down an industry group, uh, show you how I look at it relative to the benchmark S&P 500, and then really start to dig into that particular sector, uh, looking for strong industry groups, looking for uh, strong individual stocks within those industry groups. I think it'll be uh, an interesting segment, so stick around uh, if you can. All right, uh, let's get into today's technical news. Well, we did have just one economic report out today, and unfortunately, we didn't get an actual number, and it was blamed on the government shutdown. Uh, but the Q4 productivity, the estimate was for 1.6%. Unfortunately, can't tell you what that number is because we don't have it. So let's move on to uh, take a look at the 10-year Treasury yield and see what the yield is uh, telling us. Uh, not a whole lot, honestly. Here you can see, let me just get an update, make sure I have the latest. Um, yeah, it's pretty much the same. 2.68%, or actually, actually almost 2.69%. But after getting above that 20-day moving average, you can see the 10-year Treasury yield rolling over and starting to move lower. And throughout you know, most of, the, of 2018 into early 2019, when you look at the 10-year Treasury yield, you generally have a sense of what the stock market's doing because there is a strong positive correlation between the two in the short term. I've had questions come up and say, well, how can you say that there's a positive correlation? Interest rates have been going down since 1980 and the stock market's been going up since 1980. So there's actually a negative correlation. This is a short term positive correlation. When money comes out of treasuries, out of the treasury market, we get the yield rising. And at the same time that money comes out of treasuries, it tends to move over to the S&P, which sends the S&P higher. So in the short term, it's that rotation back and forth that creates that short term positive correlation. All right, let's take a look at some earnings reports out and they are really starting to come out fast and furious. You can see on your screen yesterday, we had Walt Disney come out, beat bottom line, Chubb beat Suncor Energy came up uh, quite a bit short, not only on the earnings, but also on revenues. Vertex Pharmaceuticals, this is one I touched on yesterday at the end of the show. I said that uh, I thought they'd come out with a decent report given the way the stock's been trading. A couple others I didn't think would based on the way they were trading. We'll talk about that again in just a second. Eli Lilly came up just a couple pennies short. GlaxoSmithKline beat and General Motors beat. You can see after the bell, we got another slew of reports coming out. Uh, Chipotle is going to be an interesting one. It's in that hotter uh, restaurant space. Um, that's going to be one I'm, you know, maybe we can keep an eye on uh, later in the day. But uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to, we're going to rewind, Zach, if you can. Uh, why don't you pull up that clip from yesterday right at the close? We were just kind of playing around and I talked about three stocks that I thought, based on the way they've been trading, how I thought they might report. Why don't we uh, listen to that and then we'll take a look at the charts. Before we wrapped up today, maybe we do this little game because we just talked about how, you know, companies, how they look heading into their earnings. So I pulled up a stock that's going to report after the bell tonight, Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Mm. And I want you to look at this stock relative to the biotechs. It's strong. Uh, relative to the S&P, it's been strong, even though it's pulled back a little bit lately. And the biotechs had been strong until just these past few weeks. So this one looks pretty decent to me. So we'll see how this reports um, versus I want to pull up uh, one other. And that is Electronic Arts EA. Mm -hmm. which has really struggled, bounced a little bit, but look at the relative strength here. Not good at all. And then uh, and, a, and a Darko Petroleum, APC, last one. And once again, you'll see on a relative basis, not performing well versus, the, uh, versus its peers. So I'm going to say Vertex uh, has a good report, Electronic Arts, and a, and a Darko Petroleum. Who knows? I think <laughs> it'll be an interesting little test. Okay, welcome back. Well, first, what you're, what, what we want to take a look at is Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Now, this was the one company that yesterday, when I looked at some of the relative strength charts, looked good. So even though biotechs overall haven't really done great, 
take a look at Vertex relative to the biotech group. It had been uptrending. And so when you see more money rotating toward a particular stock within a group, you have to believe that you've got Wall Street firms going out discussing things with management. They like what they hear, what they see, and they go back and they get their clients involved in these uh, companies. And that's why you get this relative outperformance. So I anticipated that Vertex would have a pretty good report. They did beat um, their expectations on both the top and the bottom line, but they did guide fiscal year 19 revenues lower, which was a little surprising. Still, the stock had gapped up. You can see about $6 on the open has pulled all the way back down, filling the gap. I'm actually watching this one closely to see whether or not we uh, uh, move back to the upside. But I don't worry as much. Uh, I mean, it's never good to have a company lower their forecast. But when they beat their, their estimates, it's telling you that they're fairly conservative. So when they lower their guidance going forward, I believe that they're being somewhat conservative. We saw that. We've always seen that with Apple. Um, when they came out back in early January, they warned, and you had a pretty good feeling that when they actually reported, they were going to beat those numbers that they had uh, forecast, the lowering of guidance, because they are very conservative in their estimates going forward. So VRTX, I think, you know, could could be the same way. I would watch this 195 level. I think if Vertex breaks out, knowing that they're one of the leaders in the uh, biotech space, the fact that it continues to uptrend against the group, and it wasn't that long ago, it was really performing well relative to the S&P 500. But this pullback, the sideways consolidation while the market keeps going up is what has uh, hurt its relative performance here the last two or three weeks. Anyhow, this is one to keep an eye on. You can see the gap up. I think that the, the technical story that was being told here came through when we got the fundamental report. Now, the other two that I talked about yesterday, and I think this is where things really uh, get kind of interesting, EA, uh, Electronic Arts was one I said, based on the way it's been trading, I would not expect much in its earnings report. They missed top line, they missed bottom line, and they guided their revenues lower going forward. It's not coincidence that a stock trades like this for six months uh, straight and hardly bounces when the overall market bounces. Some might look at this and say, oh, it's bouncing. It's going to have a good report. Well, it's more than that. You need to take a look at how it's performing relative to the rest of the market. The S&P 500 took off. So yes, EA got a little bit of a bounce because it had been so beaten up, but it was nowhere near its relative high versus the S&P 500. So I would not have been, I would not have been anticipating good results here. And that's what I talked about yesterday at the close of the show. And look at what happened when EA came out. They missed top line, missed bottom line, lowered revenue guidance, stock down 13%. I do think, I'm not somebody who likes to hold into earnings. But my point here is I think sometimes the market is giving you a clue as to what you might expect. The other one, the third uh, company that I had that uh, I talked about yesterday, Anadarko Petroleum, APC, same thing. The stock topped all the way back in July, has been downtrending. And when you look at it relative to its peers, it's been horrible. Relative to the S&P 500, it's been horrible. So when they come out and they miss top and bottom line and they guide lower, you shouldn't be shocked. Now, I actually think that this reaction hasn't been that bad. So I'm beginning to think maybe the worst is already built in to Anadarko Petroleum because you do have really bad no news out. And the stock on a relative basis still sitting up quite a bit from its prior low in December hasn't broken down. And the stock took a really steep drop. I mean, when you lose almost half of your market cap in five to six months, um, a lot of bad news is built in. So that's what this is starting to tell me is that the gap down, the sell off, and now the recovery, maybe the sellers uh, are gone here on Anadarko Petroleum. And I actually like energy over the next couple of months. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, maybe a bottom already in here on APC. As far as some of the other companies that reported, Disney. Disney beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, gapped up, but is pulled back. I actually think this one's going to turn and, and uh, move back to the upside. I'd be looking around 110. I wouldn't want to lose 110 on a closing basis on Disney. I think that's where we've already established some pretty good support. We gapped up close to 114 at the open today, pulled back. We are now down about a dollar, just under a dollar. But I think overall, uh, Disney still looks okay. Now, when you look at it relative to its peers, it continues to put in these higher relative highs and for the most part, higher lows. I don't really like what's going on here. So I want to watch this closely. And again, that's why I would make sure I keep my stop in at 110.
because it has been underperforming here over about the last five or six weeks. Uh, but Disney and the same goes versus the S&P 500. You can see Disney underperforming and its peer group has been mostly underperforming over the last five to six weeks as well. So you got to keep stops in play. But overall, when you look from left to right, I see mostly the group rising versus the S&P. I see Disney mostly rising versus the S&P and versus its peers. So I still am going to maintain a cautiously bullish stance on Disney, but just make sure we hold that 110 area to the downside. Um, let's go ahead and jump into some uh, upgrades and downgrades for today. So let's see, first upgrade, uh, let's talk, talk about SWKS. This was one of the stocks I featured at the beginning of the show. Skyworks Solutions, I think this downtrend has ended. Uh, I, it looked like it may have ended with the way it was acting in January when it got above the 20-day, held the 20-day on pullbacks, kept breaking out the new highs. You got the golden cross, the 20 above the, the 50 moving average. And now today with the repurchase, the earnings, big gap up, heavy volume. Could we pull back? Sure. But I think the pullback will be viable on SWKS. Uh, another upgrade, microchip. Actually, I think this was an initiated coverage. I think it was initiated with a buy. But microchip, uh, big gap up here also with earnings. And what's interesting, I believe Skyworks and microchip both lowered forecasts going forward. And that makes me think that uh, a lot of what we saw with the selling in the fourth quarter of last year was already built in. I think a lot, and I've been seeing this so many times with companies that are lowering guidance and refusing to go any lower in terms of their stock price. Or if they go down, they go down just temporarily and then they reverse right back to the upside. We saw Google, perfect example yesterday. Traders disappointed, open lower, finished higher by the end of the day. Here with microchip, stock going up, looks good. Um, and let's take a look at a couple of quick downgrades. One is uh, FLWS, flowers. Um, not too surprising, gap down, but then buyers came to the rescue last time I saw. Actually, it's still, it's kind of about where to open today. 1696 open, 1699. I, I don't know why the downgrade. I'm assuming it was probably valuation because the stocks made such a big move to the upside. I actually, this is one of my favorite stocks. I really like what is going on here. I love the sideways consolidation, the breakout, big volume. And this is one I mentioned recently too, that's got the strong seasonality. So for those of you maybe that weren't around, quick refresher. But let's go back over the last 20 years. And 1-800 flowers in February average is going up 1.8%. March average is going up 9.6% uh, just during that one month over the last 20 years. April, another 3.8%. So you add these up and you've got 15.2%. Uh, That's an average move for 1-800-Flowers February through April over the last 20 years. So when I see a technical breakout and it's supported by seasonal bullishness, I get uh, a lot more um, interested in a stock like that. So I think 1-800-Flowers uh, is an interesting stock, especially on a pullback. I was hoping the stock would pull back a little bit more with that uh, downgrade. CE, Salonis, uh, got downgraded today. The stock gap down has now moved back up to the upside. Let's pull this one up quickly on a relative chart. And here you can see the stock moving higher, but on a relative basis versus its peers, it just has been going nowhere. And unfortunately, its peers uh, versus the S&P 500 been downtrending. So you just got a stock that's not, you know, just kind of going along for the ride with its peer group but the peers are not very strong. So what does that mean? Well, if I was in this stock and it closed below the 20 day moving average, I would not try to come up with any excuses for the stock. Uh, I think it looks uh, kind of uh, not broken at this point on a relative basis. I think it's broken on an absolute basis. Let's watch the 20 day moving average. Recent low 95, certainly wouldn't want to lose that. All right, let's uh, give you a quick uh, summary of the upgrades and downgrades that I just covered. There were a few others uh, that you can see on your screen, upgrades and downgrades uh, that I did not cover today. PayPal, interestingly, was downgraded, along with uh, Dow DuPont. Remember, that report was not very good. Uh, I think that was out last week. All right, uh, Dan Russo, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the program back over to you. I know you got some interesting stuff. Well, great, Tom. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. You're welcome. Great rundown. 
and uh, you should all be able to see my screen now. I think Tom actually hit on a, a few great points that I'm going to touch on as well, because he spoke a lot about relative strength. And to us, relative strength is is really important. It's probably, aside from our power gauge rating, is probably the single most important factor uh, that I look at when, when analyzing the market and different areas of the market and, and different stocks. And you mentioned Skyworks and Microchip, because I think semiconductors are, uh, are a really good uh, a really good tell for the overall market. So we're going to talk about finding relative strength and and what to buy and sell now. But for kind of before we before we dive right in, for those of you who don't know, um, I've been on the street for about 19 years, which is surprising to me that uh, it's been that long, but it has been. Uh, I am a chartered market technician, so that means I've passed the three levels of the chartered market technician association's exam and earn the right to use that designation. And I'm also the co-chair of the New York chapter of the CMT Association. It's the largest uh, chapter. I think it's one of the largest chapters in the world. So that's kind of a, it's a nice honor for me that, uh, that they asked me to do that. And prior to joining Chaken Analytics back in March, I spent 10 years uh, on the sell side uh, on a sales and trading desk covering large institutional investors, mostly mutual funds, pension funds, and hedge funds here in uh, where I am in New York and also a few one-offs in, uh, in different parts of the country. So you know, that, was, that gave me a really good understanding about how these large money managers kind of view the market and what their, what their research and analysis process looks like. So uh, that is me by way of background. So really with you know, the market, the sell-off into December and the sharp rally back, you know, it's easy to get excited about the market. But for us, you know, we're always kind of wondering where is the relative strength in the market because relative strength is is what's going to lead to to outsized returns. You know, if you think about the the large mutual fund complexes, they're all running money based on a benchmark basis, right? So, you know, a, a, a mutual fund manager who owns a stock that's up fifteen percent, you might think that that's great, but if the market was up twenty percent, like he actually did a terrible job. And and the flip side is also true. If he owns a stock and it's down ten percent, you say to yourself, Wow, you know, the stock is down ten percent. But if the market was down twenty percent, well then, you know, he did a he did a great job uh, on that pick. And and the majority of, of money that's run in the world is, is run by, you know, long only managers who are who are benchmarked to to an important index, whether it's the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000 or what have you. So that's why, to me, relative strength is one of the most important factors to uh, to look at. But, you know, we start with the market and, you know, right now, I think that they're what we're going to be looking at is a key test at the 200 day moving average. I mean, here we have the, the S&P 500, you know, this chart is actually as of yesterday morning. So we're kind of bumping up against the uh, the 200 day moving average right now. One of the thing that's, things that's interesting to me that has actually given me a little bit of a pause here, especially as we get to the 200-day moving average, is that we haven't seen a, a momentum thrust off the lows. And by that, I, I'm looking at the RSI, and you know, you can see we have, you know, we got deeply oversold with the sell-off into December. But as we've rallied, and the rally has been strong and swift, there's no doubt about that. But it hasn't been able to produce an overbought condition. Now, a lot of times people say, well, you know, if something's overbought, I immediately want to sell it. For me, I use RSI as an indicator uh, of the strength of a trend. So for me, something getting overbought is not as concerning because if it's happening within the context of an uptrend, it actually tells me that that uptrend is, is strong and healthy. And if you notice that as the market was rolling over, you notice we, we were able to become oversold three times, but we never really got much above the, the 50, 55 level on the RSI. Now we have poked above it, but to get really bullish, I would love to see the market take out the 200 day moving average with some momentum confirmation. I actually want to see the market become overbought in that situation. Now, one of the other indicators that's obviously important is the, the shake in money flow indicator created by by Mark Chaikin as a sign of you know institutional buying and selling in the market, and that has been really strong. And you can see this swift rebound here, and you know part of that has to do with these readings from the steep sell-off rolling out of the calculation. It's a 21-day uh, or a 20-day calculation, but you know the fact that it's persisted uh, as these as these uh, down days have rolled off is encouraging to me. So really, for me, I want to see a break of the 200-day moving average. And I want to see that break confirmed by momentum, but we are seeing some positive developments from shake in money flow. 
Additionally, we're starting to see breadth improve. This is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their respective 200-day moving averages. And as of yesterday morning, that was sitting at uh, just over 50%. So a nice, a nice rebound with the market. I'd love to see it back uh, over 55, near 60% to give me an indication that a healthy majority of names within the index are above their uh, long-term trend lines. But uh, breath is certainly improving. I mean, look at how low we, we became uh, back in back in December with that sell-off. So a nice a nice rebound in breath is is acting as as a tailwind, and basically. This kind of gets back to a little bit of what Tom was saying. Some of the messages that we're seeing in the market right now, when we're looking for relative strength, you know, we do start at the at the index level. You know, small caps have actually been leading large caps to start the year. So to me, that's a sign of uh, of risk taking in the market. We're looking at the IWM here on an absolute basis. You can see we've kind of punched through the fifty percent retracement of the entire move from high to low. Uh, 62% retracement lines up pretty well with the uh, downward sloping 200 day moving average. So I would expect a little bit of a stall out here in the 155 to 157 area for small caps. But what's interesting to me is here as well is you know, we've seen a little bit more uh, momentum confirmation from RSI. It's slightly better than what we saw in the S&P 500. And we're in the process of breaking this relative downtrend line. So when I look at the relative performance, of small caps against the S&P 500 since the beginning of the year, we're seeing some encouraging development. So when I'm looking at relative strength and doing my work, you know, I write a note every day where I you know, highlight a, a bullish or bearish idea. The fact that small caps are, are outperforming kind of gets me to gravitate towards the small, uh, small cap of the market spectrum, if you will, whereas, you know, throughout a lot of the back half of 2018, we were avoiding small caps and for good reason, you know, solid relative downtrend up until, uh, up until just recently. Technology has also been an area of the market that's showing some good relative strength, you know, using the cues as a proxy. Again, similar dynamic at play, bumping up against the 62% retracement level, also lines up with its 200 day moving average again not seeing that momentum thrust confirmation that i would like to see but on a relative basis we've broken the downtrend line against the uh, against the s p 500 and are continuing to move higher so again when i'm looking for for ideas bullish ideas throughout my process this gives me a good roadmap i know i want to kind of be looking at some of the constituents of the cues i want to be looking in the small cap spectrum because that's where we're seeing relative uh, relative strength at the at the index level and then to me you know tom mentioned semiconductors he talked about skyworks he talked about microchip to me semiconductors are one of the most important industry groups uh, for the market. And in particular, how semiconductors are performing, again, relative to the broader market. So just kind of using using the SMH, the Van Eck uh, Vector Semiconductor ETF as a proxy for the group, you could see that you know semis topped out well ahead of, uh, of the broader market. And then on a relative basis, really started to decline back in the June, July timeframe and underperformed the market throughout the rest of 2018, leading into that major, major sell off for the S&P 500. But something as interesting happened at, because as the, the, the quote unquote market was bottoming, semis started to outperform and you're seeing a nice move higher here with that report uh, out of Microchip and that report out of Skyworks today. Uh, RSI for the semis getting close to overbought. So we are seeing a bit of that momentum confirmation. So it looks to me like semis are, are putting in a relative bottom. So that, that to me is positive uh, for the market in general. And I mean, if you read any of the transcripts or looked at the, looked at the, the notes or listened to the call, microchip actually highlighted the fact that they think, you know, Tom, you mentioned that they both cut numbers for the March quarter, but microchip said that they think March is the, is the bottom of the cycle for them. And microchip has actually has a pretty good history of calling the, the semiconductor cycle because their chips are very pervasive throughout the economy. You know, Skyworks is, is somewhat limited in that it, it's very much consumer electronics where their chips go. Microchip's chips go into 
a wide array of the products that we use on a daily basis, not just not just our phones and tablets and computers. So if they're calling a bottom here, I, I tend to listen to them just because, as I said, in my past life, I spent a lot. I spent time on a sell side desk and we had an analyst who covered microchips. So I have some some history with that company and and their pronouncements about the semiconductor cycle. So this is an encouraging sign to me again predicated on on the relative strength that we're seeing in semis against the broader market. One of the other things that's interesting to me is that we're starting to see money rotate into emerging markets. Now, some people will, will read into this that it's basically a, a valuation trade that the US is expensive relative to the rest of the world and in particular the emerging markets. I view I I, I can see that argument, but I also view it as a sign of risk appetite for investors. So again, you know, EEM, you know, breaks out here, takes out the 200 day moving average, a little bit better momentum characteristic than what we're seeing for the S and P 500. And on a relative basis, you can see this one actually broke the downtrend line in mid November. So, you know, a solid month before the market bottom. So I do think that there is an element of risk seeking going on in the marketplace right now. And you're, you can kind of, it's evidenced in uh, the relative performance of, uh, of the emerging markets as an asset class. And I think part of that as well has to do with the dollar. The dollar is beginning to roll over here. We're using uh, UUP as our proxy for, uh, for the dollar against a basket of currencies and you know, kind of topped out in early December, going lower, testing the, the downward sloping 50 day from below, still above the 200 day moving average. But if we look at the RSI for the UUP, we can see we had the negative divergence at the top where you know, price made a new high, but the RSI did not. And we've had just a series of, of lower highs on RSI. So it looks to me that the momentum is shifting for the dollar. And to the extent that the dollar continues to go lower, I think that that's going to be another tailwind for emerging markets, which we can see here, you know, dollar strength throughout most of 2018 led to emerging market underperformance. And now as the dollar is rolling over, we're starting to see some, some, some outperformance from, um, from the emerging markets. And I also think that that's a function uh, of rates heading lower as well, at least the impact there on, on the currency. You know, Tom, you mentioned, you mentioned the 10 year yield. I think that the path of least resistance for the 10 year yield is lower. Uh, just based looking at the technical picture here, you can see there's solid resistance right around the 2.8% level. Uh, TNX uh, below the 50 day moving average, below the 200 day moving average. I would not be surprised to see support give way here. And for us to maybe pull back and test the you know 2.45 to 2.5 area uh, on the 10 year yield. And what's driving that view is, is our momentum work. You can see that RSI has shifted into into bearish ranges. And this is again what I was talking about. The fact that it was able to become as oversold as it did back here towards the end of the year and, and on subsequent rallies can't retake the 50 level. To me, that's a sign that momentum is shifting uh, to the to the bearish side of the coin. And I think it's likely to continue and increases the odds that we are going to break lower. And as yields do break lower, we're going to start to see you know utilities outperform and this kind of gets back to a little bit of the mixed message of the market that we were talking about because utilities are traditionally viewed as a as a defensive sector but if we look at the XLU you know you see a nice a nice uptrend held the rising 200 day moving average and now beginning to move higher again RSI not quite where i want it to be but on a relative basis, holding above support against the S&P 500. So the XLU, I think the last time I was on the show, we were highlighting the defensive parts of the market. So they, they did their job through the market downturn uh, by outperforming the market. Now giving a little bit back, but I think as long as we hold above uh, this support level on a relative basis, I think you know it's a continue to be a good idea to, to isolate some names within the utility sector. And that goes for real estate as well. I mean, we have a breakout in the REITs looking at the XLRE ETF, you know, taking out this 34 level. And this is a really a great example of what I'm talking about and what you want to see as key resistance levels uh, are broken. Notice that the XLRE was able to become overbought here. So a momentum confirmation to the breakout and still in a nice uptrend uh, relative to the market. So 
real estate and utilities outperforming is kind of the, the, the monkey wrench, if you will. Uh, if you really want to get super bullish on the market, you have to ask yourself, well, why are these traditionally defensive sectors outperforming? It could just be a function of rates. But again, if everything was solid, Tom, you and I were talking earlier, it, you know, it, if, if everything was all systems go, you would actually expect rates to be moving higher and rates are moving lower. So I think to the extent that rates continue to move down, which I expect, I think you can still favor these defensive groups like utilities, uh, and, and real estate because that you are they are exhibiting the types of relative strength uh, that we're looking for. Now, Tom, you mentioned the VIX uh, as a sentiment indicator. Um, I, I obviously look at the VIX as well, but I also like to look at the uh, CNN Fear Greed Index, and sentiment is turning bullish. So sentiment is not as much of a tailwind now uh, as it was when we were coming off the lows. We're kind of at a 64 level, just getting into the greed portion uh, of the index. Back at the end of December, we were actually down here in the low single digits. Uh, so that you know, sentiment really did provide a solid tailwind for the lift that we're seeing uh, in the market. I mean, we've gone from extreme fear to now greed in, in a little over a month. And, and they kind of asked the question here, what emotion is driving the market? And for us, it's... A, it's an interesting question, but not asked the proper way because the way we view the world, fundamentals actually drive the market. And, you know, I, I'm a technician first and foremost, but uh, I do believe in fundamentals. I think that, you know, you want to, you know, you want to be long stocks with solid fundamentals and then use technicals to buy them the right way. So we do believe firmly that fundamentals drive the market. And it's our emotions that drive the market to extremes. And what we like to do is combine the fundamentals with technicals to give us the best opportunity to outperform. And we want to take our emotions out of the equation as much as possible. And the way that we do that is with the Chaikin power gauge rating. You know, it's a simple but powerful tool. Kind of looks like a looks like the gas gauge on your car. Rates stocks between very bullish and very bearish. And, you know, for me, especially at all times, but especially when the market's really volatile, I like to think of it as, uh, as a GPS for the market. So basically what it does is it looks at 20 factors on a daily basis, you know, from financials to earnings to technicals to expert opinions and rolls all those up and gives every stock a rating from either very bullish to very bearish. And what really intrigues me about it is these factors are the factors that my former clients, mutual fund managers and hedge fund managers, look at on a daily basis. And they spend a lot of time modeling it out and trying to get an indication of where these numbers are going to as they're making their you know decisions of you know what to be overweight and what to be underweight within the market. So we combine them all into this one model and do all of the research. Uh, we do all the research for you, and it's what's interesting is it's not just a value approach or a growth approach, right? We look at the key value factors like debt to equity and price to book and price to sales, but then we also look at the key factors that growth investors look at, right? Earnings growth, earnings surprise. Does the company have a tendency to beat expectations or do they miss expectations? How have earnings been trending uh, over the you know? short term as well as the intermediate term. Obviously, technicals are important to us, you know, looking at the typical trend and momentum uh, factors that, uh, that technical analysts look at. And then the secret sauce is really in the expert opinions. What are analysts doing with their numbers? What are analysts doing with their ratings? What are the insiders doing? So when we roll all that up, we take these 20 factors and we come out with a clear, concise indication uh, of a stock's likely potential over the next three to six months. And the reason I like the model approach is really can be summed up in, in one sentence from a, a very prominent um, money manager, uh, Jim O'Shaughnessy. Models beat human forecasters because they reliably and consistently apply the same criteria time after time as opposed to us humans who are swayed by our emotions and our opinions, right? We try to take the emotion out of the equation uh, as much as possible. We know that sometimes that's hard. We all uh, get emotional, especially when we're investing. But to the extent that you can take your uh, emotions out of the equation, it, it's really beneficial to you. So starting from the top down, we looked at the market, but 
we have an interesting way beyond just relative price strength of looking at what's likely to outperform and what's likely to underperform. And we call it the cheek and power bar ratio. And basically what we can do is we look at all the sectors of the market and all of the key industry groups. And we can see within each sector and key industry group, how many stocks are currently rated bullish or very bullish, that's in green, how many are neutral and how many are bearish or very bearish. Right, so that gives us kind of a hunting ground, if you will. If we're looking for long ideas, we want this ratio to be skewed to the bu bullish side and we want it to be stronger than that of the S&P 500. So kind of a different take uh, on relative strength. And when you combine the two, the ratios with the price performance, you, you really increase your odds of finding finding winners as well as finding names to avoid. So you know, we, we touched on the utilities, which have been outperforming. You can see 11 bullish stocks and zero bearish stocks, right? We touched on real estate six bullish stocks and, and two bearish stocks. And so once we've kind of identified the key sectors of the market, we can then drill down to the, to the industry level. So we see financials, right, is the number two sector based on this metric. And if we look within the financials, well, where, where do we want to focus our attention? Well, insurance, the, made, the large banks, as well as the regional banks are basically showing the strongest uh, ratios based on based on our model. So we start with the market, we look at the sectors, and then the industries, and then drill down to the individual stock levels. So tech, right? Tech was the was in outperforming the market. Twenty bullish stocks, eight bearish stocks. What I see here is tech is really trying to recover. Um, looking at the market the way that we do our relative strength indicator, you can see that it's working its way back up towards our performance. Not quite there yet, but you know something to keep an eye on, especially in light of that bullish ratio that I just showed you. You can see the money flow here has turned, has turned positive. We have a shorter term overbought, oversold indicator that we use. It's a stochastic of MACD. And what's interesting to me is that it never became oversold and is beginning to round higher. So to me, that's a sign of underlying strength. So when I see that bullish ratio and I see the relative performance starting to improve, you know, I want to do work on the technology sector and look for the, the industry groups within technology that are really showing relative strength. And the one that jumps out at me uh, is software and services, which has been strong. And now we've actually recently started rating ETFs. So this is the XSW. It's the uh, software and services ETF, and it has a very bullish rating. And we can see here, it's outperforming the market. M money flow is solid. It's retaken our, our long-term trend line and moving higher, right? So as I roll it down, tech is starting to improve. Software and services outperforming. Well, what are some of the names that I want to consider on the long side there? A name like Synopsys jumps out at me and just kind of Putting that under the the stockcharts.com lens, we can see a you know a nice breakout through resistance here, rising 200-day moving average, and I use the scooter line uh, as as my gauge of relative strength. And you can see here, this was as of yesterday, uh, a reading a reading of 88. So you know, solid outperformance combined with with shake and money flow in a in a leading industry group type of name that I want to be long. I actually had the honor of writing. Mark Chaikin's uh, Market Insights note this past weekend, and this was my uh, my bullish stock of the week. So, um, just a little bit of my process and how I go about stock selection. Another name uh, within the group uh, two weeks ago in his Market Insights newsletter, Mark called out Cadence Design. Right, similar dynamics at play, breakout through key resistance. So we can combine our traditional technical analysis, um, but we know the fundamentals are good because the our model is bullish on cadence. So the breakout, solid outperformance based on scooter, solid shake in money flow, type of name we want to own, leading, leading stock in a leading industry group. Financials, financials are another group that we're watching closely, right? We, sh we saw the ratio it was the number, two, uh, number two sector, bullish uh, ETF rating, beginning to outperform the market. With, uh, with bullish money flow. Now our indicator here is oversold, so it could be an opportune time if you trade ETFs to potentially look at the XLF as it's beginning to outperform. But if you wanna take it a step further and look at the industry level, we highlighted that uh, insurance was the, was the top industry group. So KIE here, our proxy for the insurance industry group, 
showing some good outperformance. And we look at a name like Aflac. This was actually my bullish stock of the day in my note to clients today. Breaking out, you know, solid, solid scooter score, money flow starting to turn bullish. So a name like Aflac, based on our process, backed up by the power gauge rating, really gave me confidence to go out and make that uh, our bullish stock of the day. The flip side is where are we seeing weakness? And consumer staples did a great job as a defensive group when the market was selling off. But now as we're rallying, relative strength in the staples is actually beginning to turn lower. And you can see our ETF rating here is, uh, is neutral on the staples. So I think staples are on the verge of going to um, start to underperform the market. And one of the areas, um, one of the stocks that, that kind of jumps out at me is a potential bearish candidate, or if you long it, a, a source of funds is Costco, right? Breakdown, rally back to the 200-day moving average and beginning to roll over again. But look what's happening with Scooter here. Out, underperforming the market. This trend of outperformance has now turned to a trend of underperformance. Uh, so this is a name uh, that we certainly want to, uh, want to avoid. When I look at an industry group, food and beverage on the verge of, of breaking down on a relative basis, Notice that money flow has stayed um, pretty bearish throughout most of the time frame. The persistency of money flow has been bearish since July. So the food and beverage stocks, that's an area that I would avoid or potentially if you trade to the bearish side, look for opportunities when they present themselves. This was actually a recent name that I highlighted as a bearish idea. It's uh, Boston, uh, Boston Beer, the makers of Sam Adams, very creative with our ticker symbols here. Uh, this is a stock that you know is, is bearish to me. Broken through the 200-day moving average, moving sideways just a bit. But look at look at how it's performing on a relative basis. Really starting to to underperform the market with a big character shift here. We've gone from solid shake in money flow, solidly bullish shake in money flow, to now a lot of bouts of bearish money flow. So that tells me that institutional investors are coming out of this stock. And you know, if, you, if you're long it and you've, you've been long it this whole time, I think it's a good opportunity to take some money off the table. And if you do trade to the bearish side, I think you want to potentially look at uh, setups to take advantage of uh, further weakness in, in Boston beer. So again, the power gauge is what drives everything we do from a stock selection level and now even from an ETF level because it gives you a you know, it, it puts the odds in your favor. We know that our very bullish and our bullish stocks are likely to outperform the market. We know that our bearish stocks and our very bearish stocks are likely to underperform the market. So as we're doing our relative strength work, we use we use that in conjunction uh, with with the power gauge rating. We actually have a product that I think is a great complement to stock charts. It's uh, called our Power Pulse product, which gives access to the uh, to the to the power gauge rating for for different stocks and ETFs. And you know, just kind of by way of example, you know, Apple, right? Everybody's everybody's darling for a long time. Our power gauge rating actually turned bearish on Apple up here around the two ten. Uh, 215 level before it really started to roll over. So having that rating, you know, gave our clients a, a great opportunity to sidestep this this leg lower, and you can see it started to underperform the market shortly thereafter. And just like when we saw it on the charts here, here is where the rating turned negative. But at the time, the stock was still outperforming. So the the power gauge rating. Uh, can really help you sidestep the the landmines that are going to uh, blow up your portfolio, and also just kind of tilt the odds in your favor when you're when you're looking for long ideas. And you know, with the Power Pulse product, you can you can set up your portfolio and monitor it. And every day, you'll you'll see what the power gauge rating is for for the stocks that you're watching or the stocks that your portfolio. All of the research is done for you. We crunch the numbers every night, and the ratings update uh, early early the next morning. And in addition, you get uh, Mark's weekly market commentary. It comes out Sunday afternoons from time to time. I write it as well, but it's in that commentary where we kind of give you everything you need to know for the week ahead, and we highlight. You know, bullish or bearish ideas on the bullish side, for instance, like cadence or like a synopsis. So when I was when I knew I was coming on the show today, you know, I really feel so strongly uh, about the power gauge rating that I got uh, I got the team to offer up a, a special deal here. You can try Power Pulse for just ten dollars for the first month, 
after which it would renew at the uh, regular uh, discounted price of $24.95. It's a special that we're running for the stockcharts.com community. And if you're interested, you can head over to our site, chickenanalytics.com forward slash stock charts to sign up. So that's, um, those are my thoughts on the market. And I'm, uh, I'm here for, for any questions. I love the Q and A. All right. Perfect. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, there are a couple questions here. Great. Uh, one was just, uh, relating back to uh, what you had talked about the New York chapter, the CMT. Somebody was asking how many members are in that chapter. Do you know, <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, how many I can certainly find out and, and get that information to you. Uh, I do know that it's one of the largest chapters in the world, as you would expect with a lot of the financial professionals that are located kind of in the tri-state area here. But um, I don't know the exact number. Okay. I also grade the level three exams for anybody who's interested in uh, joining the program. There you go. Do they get a special grade if they sign up for your uh, check? And I cannot comment on that. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw it in there. No, we actually, um, <laughs> the folks who uh, who took it actually just found out last week what their what their results were. So, uh, some uh, some excited friends out there. Yeah, but no, we don't actually we don't actually know whose exams we're grading. As you would imagine, they're they're coded, and obviously they don't tell us whose exams we're grading. Yes, of course. I was just joking. All right. So another viewer um, asked, um, how important is the Chaken oscillator to use with the CMF? The, vis or the uh, viewer uses them both together. I think that anything that you can use that gives you confidence in, in your analysis um, is important if it works for you. Um, the Chaken Oscillator is not as widely used as, as Chaken Money Flow. Um, but I think like any other indicators, you kind of, they, they tell you a story, right? So when the, when the indicators line up, that should give you more conviction than when the indicators are, are in different directions, right? So if I'm thinking about, if I'm thinking about how I look at a stock, right? I, I want stocks that are outperforming the market. I want them when they're oversold. I want a bullish or very bullish power gauge rating. So when all of those are in gear, my conviction level is higher. But if you know maybe two of those are positive and two of those are, are iffy, I might look for a better opportunity somewhere else. So you know, I don't think what you use is as important as how you use them and the story that they're telling. If if everything lines up, that should increase your conviction level. If you know, it's like a way to the evidence approach, if you will, right? If you if you have a checklist of five things that you look for before you buy a stock or an ETF and all five, and you can check the box on all five of them. To me, that's a high conviction trade. If you can only check the box on three out of five, maybe you want to look somewhere else. Or maybe if you're, you know, you really want to put the trade on, maybe you don't put on your full size. Maybe, you know, you put on a half a position and see how things play out. So I think it's more important to get confirmation rather than the indicators that you use. I think as long as you're using indicators that number one, you understand how they work and why they work and you're comfortable with them from there. I think I like to, I, you know, I tell our clients make a checklist and take a weight of the evidence approach. If you can check whatever, whatever it is, if you can check all the boxes, that's a high conviction trade. If you can't check all the boxes, then you have to adjust your conviction level. All right, I've got a, two more questions, uh, quick ones. I'm going to go ahead and take the screen, but before I do, I just want to remind everybody, you can go to www.chakenanalytics.com slash stock charts for the special that Dan has up on the screen. So let me go ahead. I want to show you a chart here of the SMH, Dan, um, because the question is, and you talked about this, you, you said that you really like the fact that semiconductors, or you like it when semiconductors are strong. It's a really important part of the market. So one of the viewers pointed out that the SMH right now has the RSI up at 69, almost to 70. And you can see across this chart over the last several months, we have not been to that level. So would you make uh, the, would you come to the conclusion based on the way that this SMH, SMH is trading, that this overall is very bullish for the market going forward? Uh, I, I think it is. I, more important than the SNH, SMH for me on an absolute basis is how it's performing on a relative basis, which is, which I showed on the chart as well. But it's interesting to me, right? Because while it was, you know, from kind of September, October, November, as it was in a downtrend, notice that the RSI never became overbought, 
right? To me, that tells you that that's a strong trend, right? I don't use RSI in the traditional sense of, you know, sell at 30, buy it, sell at 70, buy at 30. I use it more as confirmation of the trend. So when I see, when I see it's not able to become overbought, that tells me that that downtrend is strong. I actually am encouraged here that the SMH is on the verge of becoming overbought because it tells me that this emerging uptrend likely has legs. And you can do the same analysis. You can do the same analysis here on the relative chart, right? Tom's put up SMH relative to the SPX. You're seeing a similar dynamic at play. Notice that through the entire time it was underperforming, it never became overbought. In fact, it had a hard time in most cases getting above the 50 level, right? It wasn't until it wasn't until that spike in November that it took out the 50 level. Now, now it's finding support at the 50 level and on the verge of becoming overbought, that is a signal to me that this emerging trend likely, right? Nothing's absolute or or for certain, but that this emerging trend likely has some legs to it. Awesome. All right, one last question, and that is, um, I'm going to pull up the dollar chart here first, because the question that came in was, uh, given the dollar's weakness, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the dollar topped back in December. You can see these tops here, and it's been mostly in decline for about the last seven or eight weeks. Uh, the question is, with the dollar weakness, and you talked about the EEM, but what about gold? Because gold has been so strong. Do you think that this weakness in the dollar will continue to provide this momentum that gold has been seeing? I think it. I, I think it could actually. I mean, I didn't touch on gold here. I mean, I could sit here and go all day with with the charts that I look at and what's interesting to me. But what I will say is, to the extent that the dollar continues to underperform, that's obviously a tailwind for gold. And if you just if you're curious on what my position on gold is, I was actually um, I was on Bloomberg TV about a week and a half ago on one of their segments called um, Futures Charting Futures, uh, where I talked about gold as as my bullish idea. So. I, I think it's a little bit overdone here in the near term. At the time, I was talking about a breakthrough 1300, likely tar likely targeting 1360 in the near term. We broke through 1300, and, and we're kind of pulling back. So from a trend perspective, I still like gold. Don't necessarily know if I would chase it right here, but yes, I, I think that that the way of that way of looking at it is correct. To the extent that the dollar continues to weaken, that is a tailwind for gold. And I just pulled up the longer term chart here just to show that overhead resistance that you were talking about. Yeah, right there at the at the thirteen sixty level. But you know, you can see you you know it's a solid run. I, I do like I do like gold. I actually because I actually think I do think as I said the path of least resistance is lower for yields, so that should kind of spill over into into a weakening dollar and be a tailwind for gold. Okay. Awesome. Always and your time frames matter, right? Absolutely. You, I think if you're trading for the next uh, next three days, I'm probably not chasing it here. But you know, a pullback, a pullback to to that 1300 area uh, sets up a great opportunity, especially with the moving averages just below. You're looking at a 20. Is that that's a 20 day moving average? So you probably line up with 1300 on a pullback. I think it's a it would be a good opportunity. Yeah, certainly would reduce the risk of a trade. Uh, down at that area. All right. Always a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. Uh, we get so much information from you. Your relative strength presentation was awesome. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, uh, for taking the time to listen. I look forward to uh, coming back soon. Sounds good. Take care, Dan. Thank you. All right. There he goes. Another great presentation by Mr. Russo, uh, talking a lot about re relative strength. Of course, that's what we talk about a lot on here. And I think it's really important. It's a big part of technical analysis. And I think one of the things that Dan touched on earlier in his presentation, talking about how, you know, if you've got a money manager who's up, uh, you know, 20 percent and the market's only up 15 percent, you might say, hey, 20 percent pretty good. Well, it's actually really good if the benchmark's up 15%. On the other hand, if the benchmark's up 15%, you got a, a, a manager is doing 8-10% for you, well, you could put your money in the SPY and earn 15%. So uh, that kind of underperformance, not very good. But relative strength is the key. I always say my goal is to try to outperform the S&P 500, and it's really difficult to do that if you're in areas of the market that are underperforming. Okay, let's get into the 10 in 10. Um, the first stock is uh, GPS, which is uh, Gap. Let me see if we can pull this up here. Here we go. And all right, so I've annotated a few things here. Number one, you can see that 
uh, GPS gap has got the lower highs in play. It's got some equal lows. So off of a downtrend, you really have a descending triangle in play. This is a bearish pattern. Um, when you look at what's been going on in the space and its peers, the retail apparel, uh, it topped back at the beginning of November. And yes, we have recovered off the lows, but not you know, too far. And look at gap uh, relative to its low in December. See where the retail apparel uh, group was and where gap was? And then take a look at where it is now versus uh, the, the retail apparel. So you, we've got all these retailers jumping back to the upside, but gap is still trading near its low. So I don't have to tell you what this relative strength looks like. Gap relative to the apparel retail index, horrible. Relative to the S&P, horrible. And then retail uh, apparel retailers relative to the S&P 500 have been declining since the end of October. So you've got a really uh, a, a, a group that has been in decline on a relative basis, and you've got one of the worst performers. So I'm not going to like this stock. Now, some might look at it and say, we're at support. I want to buy. That's fine, but I would be anticipating with this uh, pattern that it's going to break down. I think the odds are that you're going to get a breakdown when you have a bearish pattern like this following a downtrend. You look at this as a continuation pattern. So I would not be surprised to see some bad news come out on Gap and to see this 24 and a quarter area taken out. So I am going to pass on GPS. Next up, uh, the most popular in the room today was the QQQ, which of course is the ETF that tracks the NASDAQ 100. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's done everything that it could possibly do over the last six weeks um, that we talked about. It's gotten back through uh, recent price resistance. We had price support that was broken in December. We went back through that. We got through the 20-day moving average. We've gotten through the 50-day moving average. And notice on pullbacks, we're holding that rising 20-day moving average. So even the selling is contained as we continue to move back up. So when I'm looking at this chart, there's a couple things that stand out, and they're both going to be price resistance, uh, or actually three of them are going to be price resistance. And you've got you know, when you're trying to recover on a chart, it's really like a stair step approach. You have to take out one level after another. 172 and a half up to about 178. We've got three tops on the chart that we're going to have to negotiate before we can think about going back to this double top that formed back in uh, August and October. So lots of work still to do here on the QQQ. But as long as we continue to trade bullishly and hold that rising 20 day moving average, I think that we're just going to continually take down these resistance levels to the upside. Now, if we roll over, move back through the 20-day moving average, we got a different ball game. But until then, I would look at this uh, as being pretty bullish. All right, third stock will be ARRY. I believe this is a biotech array. Biopharma, yeah, breakout really looks nice. It's a smaller company. So I don't know how many products they have, but it's not going to be a company with a lot of products. So the big risk here is that they come out with some bad news on one of their products going forward. That's always the risk with these smaller biotechs. I'm pretty sure that this is categorized as a biotech, and it is. So here you've got a stock that's breaking out above its earlier highs in 2018, summer of 2018. And you can see the biotechs are nowhere near their 2018 high. So you've got a great looking relative chart. Stocks performing great versus the S&P. Biotech's really just kind of going along for the ride with the S&P. Not a, not a great area, but not an awful area either. Uh, so let's just take a look at the uh, technicals on ARRY. I like the breakout. I think eventually we could get a pullback to test this rising 20-day. You've got what I consider to be the best price support on the stock, probably closer to 18 and a quarter. Stock would have to drop about 10% to get back down near that area. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, we saw here 18 and a quarter back down to 1660. That was probably about eight or 9% over four or five days. It could easily do it again. So I would be looking to enter with less risk. I would also be careful on position sizing on a, um, these smaller biotechs because I, I've been there before where you wake up to some bad news. The FDA says they need further information or you know, the trials didn't pass, whatever. And some of these companies can lose 50% or more overnight. So you, you want to be careful about position sizing in a stock like this. Otherwise, I uh, have nothing bad to say. It looks like a pretty good chart. All right, let's take a look at um, EHC. 
and uh, this is Encompass Healthcare or Health Corp. Um, been in a downtrend. You can see healthcare providers were actually doing really well up until the beginning of December, but EHC had topped all the way back in August. So what that means is that on a relative basis, we've been seeing weakness here for quite some time. You can see relative support. And I want to annotate that because I don't want to lose that relative support level. Um, not, I'm already not happy with the way the stock's been trading, but another break below this triple bottom in terms of relative support would not be good. I don't really have good feelings about the stock relative to the S&P not doing well. And we can see even healthcare uh, providers have turned down a little bit. I think that, that their strength, the, the group strength, is going to return at some point. But for now, uh, I would be watching probably this rising 20-day moving average. Given that this has been an underperformer, I think if we pull back and lose that 20-day moving average, I think we could have some issues going forward. So I would uh, be just a little bit skeptical here with EHC. All right, number five. Nectar Therapeutics, NKTR. Um, another one that's been under pressure for quite some time in the biotech space, but once again, just bottom of the barrel in terms of relative strength. It's trying maybe to carve out a bottom. So let's see, you know, maybe if we could break out back out, out above this breakdown, I'm going to say 46, 47 was a pretty big area of support that was lost. So we now need to get back up above that area. So the levels I'm looking at right there, you can see these lows. And then also another one was at this low before we had the big drop. So we came back up into that zone. I think if we could break above 48, get some volume coming in, I'd feel better. Until then, I uh, would be passing on this one. All right, next up, number six, BLUE. This is a, another biotech, I believe, Bluebird. Yep, Bluebird Biotech, lots of biotech requested. All right, uh, I think, again, you got a stock that hasn't been a great performer, starting to show a little bit of relative strength, but let's get a breakout. So where's the key level to watch for? I think it is at the, I think it is right here at about 138. And you can see these tails up here getting up to about 140 intraday, not able to hold it. We've got the rising 20-day that's been performing great to the downside. I think we're squeezing. We either need a breakout above 140 or we break down below that rising 20-day. Whichever way it breaks is the way I would play it. Um, again, because it's been underperforming, I would need to see that breakout and see some volume coming in before I'd commit on the long side. AFL, AFLAC. Um, yeah, this is one I think uh, Dan Russo mentioned, um, you know, that he really liked, I think just sent out to his members. I completely agree. I mean, when we talk about stocks, what I really like are stocks that across the board, we got left to right going up. Now here, life insurance has not been a great area of the market. So you do have to worry a little bit about that. Although it has come off the December low and has been strengthening. But the um, AFLAC relative to the S&P has been rising. AFLAC relative to its peers has been rising. So I, I would totally agree. I think this is a chart that I would maybe watch that rising 20-day moving average. But here was a clear area of resistance just below $48. We've cleared it. Look at the volume coming in on the move and so far holding the 20-day. So I think this is a good-looking chart. I would prefer a good looking chart in a really good looking industry. I think the industry here is still to question and life insurance stocks tend to struggle when rates go lower. So if you're in the camp that you think rates go down, 10 year treasury yield goes down, that'll be a headwind for the stock. Uh, otherwise, I think it looks uh, pretty good. And again, it is one of the top relative performers. All right, three more. Uh, WM Waste Management. This is one that's in the poll that is currently running. Uh, I like waste management. I think you got, first of all, the group is trying to break out, which is much better than the S&P 500. You've got uh, waste management, which is one of the better stocks within the uh, waste and disposal area. It's also uh, strong relative to the S&P. And here's the, the waste and disposal group relative to the S&P 500. So this is what I'm talking about, left to right, moving higher across the board. Uh, I have problems having any problems with a stock like this. So annotating this one, I think your key price support 
is going to be at about 94 and a quarter. And that's right where your 20 day moving average sits almost exactly. So pull back to the low 94, 94 and a half area, something like that, I think would be good entry into waste management. All right, number nine, two more to go, SSYS. Stratasys, nice breakout. And this is in uh, excuse me, computer hardware, which has just started to show strength. And you've got a stock that's breaking out. So as long as this relative strength continues, this is a stock I think you could certainly own. I like the breakout. Um, I like the performance relative to the S&P 500, which is right here. You can see this huge spike up. And the fact that we now have a breakout, I think, is awesome. So SSYS making the breakout. Now, it's going to be very overbought. It's had a huge move to the upside. I think the selling in this stock was way overdone. Volume coming in. But I would also mark key gap support, which is down just below 24. I don't know. Maybe you get a, a valuation downgrade or something. The stock could have a couple bad days. If it were to get back down anywhere near 24, I would think that that would be a great entry into SSYS. And then the last stock for today will be alarm.com, A-L-R-M. This used to be on my strong earnings list. I think maybe it still is. Uh, another one, yeah, really beautiful breakout. This is a great performer in a great industry. So this is the kind of stock that I would have no problems owning in my portfolio if I was going to hold. So you've got, uh, let's annotate this. You've got the triple top, essentially triple top breakout that occurred in middle of January. Good volume coming in in this move to the upside. So I think there's some accumulation taking place. Rising 20-day moving average held back at early January. I think it'll hold again if we pull back. But look at these other charts uh, on this. You've got software, which just broke out above this double top, not too far from breaking out. It has, uh, well, you've got ALRM relative to software. It's one of the leaders. Software down here is trying to make a breakout versus the S&P 500. And Alarm already has made the breakout versus the S&P 500. So I think you got a really good chart here. Uh, like I said, a pullback. I don't like to chase, so I'd like to see a pullback. But uh, ALRM looks really strong to me. So those are the 10 in 10 stocks. We'll bring up a quick summary here for you that you can take a look and uh, we'll get into that final market update. Just bear with me one second. Okay, so final market update. And I've done this one just a little bit different, put uh, different industry groups in here. So let's see what's going on. All right, you got the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It has now gone green, only a quarter of one point. So don't get too excited. But it is up. Uh, the S&P 500 uh, down five points currently. The uh, NASDAQ off of its lows down 23 points. The Russell 2000 also well off of its earlier lows down two points. Ten-year Treasury yield continues to sit right around that 269 level. Volatility index continues to drift lower. That's bullish for equities. Here's a group that's really taking it on the chin today. Media agencies, the Dow Jones U.S. Media Agencies Index, DJUSAV down 4.6%. The two stocks really uh, pushing this index down. Interpublic Company uh, right here down more than 6% and Omnicom down almost 5%. You can see huge drops leading this index to the downside. Other uh, areas of the market not doing so well today. Home construction uh, with uh, rates down a little bit. You might think that they would we'd get a breakout, but we're pulling back. I think overall we've got a nice uptrend still in play off the December low. But I would actually like to see this 50 day or excuse me, 20 day moving average hold retail stocks struggling a little bit, although they are off their lows. This is the XRT, which is a widely diversified ETF in the retail space. And then finally, I mentioned earlier today, Dow DuPont received a downgrade. This stock also missed its earnings expectations last week, lowered its guidance going forward. That's where we had this big gap down. And after rallying yesterday, you can see the bears are at it again today, the stock down more than 1%. All right, we are going to go into our final segment of the day, and this is a new segment. Um, and uh, I don't think that uh, Aaron and I have done this one before, but break it down. And so what I'm gonna do for you is simply break down one sector of the market, how I look at it. And uh, we'll talk about some, some stocks and some industry groups within the sector. 
as we go through. One final reminder, too, we, uh, we do have a poll running. So if you'd like to participate in the poll, um, it uh, features four stocks, I believe, that are in the industry groups that I'm going to cover. So I'm going to start with the industrials. So the first thing I want to show you is the XLI. And if you take a look at the XLI right here, you can see that we have been going higher for the last six weeks, like the overall market. And we are trying to take out this double top, November and December. A move through 74 would do that. Now, I like the XLI because I believe that we are in a cyclical, well, I think we're coming out of a cyclical bear market within a secular bull market. I think the market goes higher, stock market. And so I'm looking for strength from the relative, a relative strength for some of these aggressive groups. So what I want to take a look at first is let's take a look at the XLI relative to the S&P 500. And the way you do that is use a colon. And if you want to see how one stock performs against an index or another stock, all you have to do is put a colon between them. XLI colon dollar sign SPX. That's the symbol for the S&P 500. I'm going to go down here and switch from candlesticks because candlesticks just make a relative chart really noisy. Um, so we got a solid line and then I'm going to go back. Uh, I'm going to go 10 years and we're going to do a weekly look at this. And I want to show you a couple things here with the XLI that you might not see with the naked eye. Now we had, we've been in a bull market. Now granted we're coming out of a cyclical bear, but I believe we are still in a secular bull market. So when I see the group, or a group, an aggressive group like the industrials performing well and continuing to set new relative highs and relative lows, I think this is really important for um, a bull market to continue, secular bull market. So here are the lows. So yes, we have periods of weakness, but what you can do is I can take the, hit the command and the left clicker here on the mouse pad and I can just drag the same sloped line and I it it looks like it's I don't have I can't reach all the way across but you can kind of see that's pretty close to touching all of these relative highs while we also touch these relative lows with the same sloped line so this is what I would call a, a relative up channel in other words industrials over a long period of time have been outperforming but we go through periods of underperformance and when we come out of those periods, it tends to be a really good thing for the market. So I don't know where we want to draw this line. Maybe something like that. Um, then we come down here and look at that. And then just more recently, maybe something like that. But, you know, industrials will go through periods, just like a stock rotates out of favor for a period of time before it makes another move to the upside. Same thing happens with leadership in sectors. So you've got sector strength here in uh, industrials, sideways consolidation, periods of weakness, breakout leadership, sideways consolidation, periods of weakness, breakout leadership, finally, another area of sideways to down relative strength, but we stay within this relative up channel, and now we're just breaking it. So if we make this move from here, all the way back up to challenge this upper line, you can imagine that if the market is strong, how much stronger industrials are going to be. So that's the basis for me looking at the XLI. Now, within the XLI, what are we going to, how are we going to come up with our, um, you know, our areas to look at? Well, RRG, this is another tool here at Stock Charts that you can use to help identify um, areas of relative strength. So I've put in here the benchmark XLI, and I've put all of the industry groups in the XLI into the, in as symbols. And now I can look at how they're performing relative to the benchmark XLI. All right, so I could, now this is a one-year weekly chart that I have here. And you can see as I drag through the year how these different groups perform on a relative basis. Now we've had Julius de Kempinar on. He is the founder, creator of these relative rotation graphs. And he has said on many occasions what he looks for are groups that move into the leading area Come down because you're going to get, you're not going to lead all the time. You're going to come down with some weakness into weakening, and then you're going to turn back up. 
Now, when I look at the, the where we are right now, and I'm looking at what's leading, um, I see commercial vehicles and trucks. I see aerospace, um, the yellow weakening, which is where I like to look as well, waste and disposal, airlines and railroads. So these are the five that I would probably consider the most. Now, you might look at this and say, well, what about these that are improving, that are looking really good? And if I pull, pick up one of these, um, let's see, which one is that? Uh, let me tell you here. Nope, not that one. Okay, so here is the diversified industrials. Now, if I go back and I just show you since the decline, take a look at where diversified industrials stay. We, we show strength from time to time, but we can't get off the left side of the chart. When it's going up here, this is the momentum side of the chart. So when they're going up into this improving quadrant, they are showing good momentum, but they haven't crossed over this uh, uh, vertical line, which is your relative strength line. So even though they're improving, even though you're seeing the diversified industrials improving, they're not yet showing relative strength. So I don't like them here just yet. What I would be focusing on instead, aerospace. So let's take a look at aerospace. Back at the peak, you can see how it's staying on the right-hand side. So the momentum is slipping. That's, that's the, this axis over here. When you're going down, you're slipping on momentum, but you're on the right side. You're still showing relative strength. Now watch what aerospace does as we go through here. See how it turns back up, and each time it looks like it's going to go into lagging, and then it turns back. It is strengthening into the leading index. So aerospace is one area we want to keep an eye on. Uh, I'm not, I could go through all of these, but it would take a while. I'm going to uh, just focus on two others that I like. And this is the, the disposal, uh, waste and disposal services. Uh, check this one out. Same thing. See how it just stays on the relative strength side? Now, it's been losing a little bit of strength here recently, but it's still on the right-hand side. And I anticipate that we're going to get a move back up into the uh, leading quadrant again. And then the last one I, I want to show you is railroads. Railroads just seem to be kind of stuck down here in the weakening, but staying on the right side. So still showing relative strength, but it's been stuck just below the leading quadrant for a while. Let's look for a catalyst, but I would not rule out railroads to lead this market again back to the upside. So those are the three areas. Those are the three industry groups based on my analysis here using the RRG that I would really want to pay attention to. So what do you do with that? Well, one thing we can do with it is we can go in now that we know the three industry groups, let's go in and look at the scooters. See how I'm combining a lot of these different tools here at Stock Charts to come up with good investing ideas, trading ideas. Now, here are the large caps. Now I can switch to mid and small cap, but I'm going to stick with large cap for now. And which groups did we just talk about? Aerospace. If I type in aerospace into this, you will see the aerospace stocks come up and they're in scooter order. Boeing and Transdime, those are two stocks that are in the poll and also two stocks that I think look really good technically. Uh, we pull up Boeing, uh, clear breakout above the October high. Market hasn't broken out, but Boeing has. So you got a great stock not only relative to the overall market, but also relative to the industrials. Industrials haven't set a new high. Uh, so Boeing with its 99, 98.9 scooter looks pretty good. Transdime, TDG, look at this one. Look at the volume coming in to support this breakout of sideways consolidation. When the market was horrible in December, it held its prior low. Now it's moved back up and broken out with the uh, recent strength in the market. Clearly, TDG is a solid relative performer. Let's keep going back, take a look at some others. Um, I could go into mid caps, for instance, and there's aerospace. Spirit Aerosystems. I mean, I could go right you know, down the list here, but it's giving you the best uh, stock charts technical rank. That's what the scooter is. Um, and it, it's a mechanical formula that focuses 60% on long-term indicators, 30% on midterm or medium range indicators and 10% on short term. So if all of a sudden you get a pop, uh, stock doesn't go up to 90 in the 90s on its stock charts technical rank. It needs to exhibit strength for a long period of time. That's why it's important to, to at least be aware of what these scooter scores are. And then small cap stock, same thing. I could go right down the list. Here are some scooters among small caps in the 90s within aerospace. 
Notice not a lot of volume on some of these stocks, though, so you want to be careful with that. Next up, how about railroads? Uh, railroad, actually, is nothing in the small cap. Let's go to the mid cap. You got Genesee and Wyoming, a, a 58 scooter. Not really interested there. Large cap, Union Pacific. This is one of those on the uh, poll. It's got a scooter of 84.7. Let's pull the chart up. Uh, trying to make a breakout. I would really watch this 165 level because that would be a breakout in Union Pacific. Again, even though the S&P 500 is not broken out. And then the last one I wanted to show just briefly would been or was the uh, waste waste and disposal services here. And there's waste management with a scooter of 80. And we'll take a look at that chart. But again, I could do the, the mid cap and the small cap stocks. But waste management's made a breakout. S&P hasn't broken out. So you got a relative leader here. Stock looks real good. All right, let's uh, quickly pull up the summary and then we'll pull up the poll. And uh, then we'll wrap up the show here. So break it down, and when you get to that survey at the end, uh, below your video player, I'd love to hear what you think of break it down and taking a look at one sector like this and working our way using RRG, using the scooter, using the relative charts, um, and then pulling up individual stocks. I think it's a pretty interesting way, and you saw how fast I did it. Ten minutes, uh, went through the entire you know, industrials, quickly zeroing in on some of the things that might make sense. Uh, but there's your summary. Now let's go ahead and bring that poll up. And we can talk about that for a second. I'll give you a surprise on who I'm going with. I did cast my vote, and I went with the minority. I went with Trans Dime. Now, the thing you have to realize with, and, and Boeing is not a bad choice. Trust me, I think Boeing's a great company and certainly is deserving of, uh, of a lot of votes. But the one thing that I'll say about uh, Boeing versus, say, Trans Dime is that when you look at their market caps, so with a stock like Boeing, uh, you've got a market cap of, pulling it up right now, $234 billion. Transdime has a market cap of $22 billion. So Boeing is essentially uh, about 10 and a half times the size of Transdime. So I think TDG is going to have an easier time growing, um, given that it's not nearly as big. But Boeing's a great company. Boeing is a great company. So 52% of you went with Boeing. 28% uh, Waste Management, 12% Union Pacific, 8% uh, Transdime Group, and I think they're all good choices. I like all four of the companies. Again, Union Pacific, I want to see that breakout. The other three have already broken out, but I think it's just a matter of time before we get that breakout on UNP as well. All right, let's see. We got uh, just about a minute to go, so why don't I just show you what's going on in the market as we get ready to wrap up the show. And you can see here the Dow is almost flat today, down less than one point. NASDAQ struggling a little bit on a relative basis, down 20. S&P 500 uh, down four and a half points, really not, not much at all. Considering how much we've moved to the upside, if this is the market's way of pulling back, uh, this is not much at all. I would certainly say that. As far as some of the scooters, and this is another way to quickly look at the market, make sure under this gear shift thingy up here that you have your additional panels checked. And if you do, you can then change these technical rankings if you'd like to whatever you want to move them to. I like to keep them on the scooters, though. Large cap, mid cap, small cap. I can quickly see what is moving fast. SWKS, we saw that earlier. Uh, probably a couple of these others. Voyo reported its earnings making a move today. Anyway, I think it's a great way to uh, take a look at the market. Oh, uh, let's see. I think that's about it. Uh, we do have an exciting schedule coming up. I talked about this a little bit as we open the program, uh, but Roman Bogomazov will be with us um, tomorrow. And then Mary Ellen joins me on Friday and a couple uh, exciting things coming up next week as well. So I uh, do appreciate everybody stopping by. I uh, do also want to encourage you to complete the survey. It's located below the video player. I would love to get your feedback and think uh, or hear what you thought of that final segment. Uh, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.